necessary on Radio Sputnik in Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Sean Blackman, here with Jackie Lukeman. And as always, we are your guide for connecting the political, social, and economic movements shaping the world around us. And it's Friday, which means we're having our weekly segment, The Red Spin Report, where we discuss sports, politics, and struggle with Nate Wallace, co-host of The Red Spin Sports Podcast. Nate, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, glad to be back, Sean and Jackie. Absolutely. And Nate, I wanted to begin today talking about the National Football League saying that it will end the practice of race norming uh, when it comes to uh, a concussion settlement that it has with uh, a number of players. Now, like I say, this is all connected to, you know, uh, uh, lawsuits uh, against the league as it pertains to uh, issues with percussions and head injuries, something that's a pervasive issue with the NFL and that we talk about a good bit uh, here on the Red Spin Report. But I, I wasn't even familiar uh, with with this as um, a concept. I mean, uh, basically, this this uh, notion of race norming sort of suggests that different players of different races have different levels of like cognitive function. And therefore, that should be taken into account when considering um, the depth and impact of of these uh, head and brain injuries. And you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, Nate, but I have to say <clears throat> in the broadest sense, I mean, this smacks of like a phrenology, like eugenic race science type of deal uh, being employed uh, by the NFL. And I think this came to light a few years ago as a result of a lawsuit by some players. But I was hoping you could sort of help break down just what's going on uh, with this issue. And how do you think it reflects on this broader problem of uh, of the head injury piece in the NFL. Yeah. So this kind of came to light last year when, uh, you know, former running back to the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, and, you know, star and college player at the university of Miami, Najee Davenport, along with former player Kevin Henry um, had their concussion claim denied. And when it started getting into the reasoning for it, um, it became clear that the only reason that like, you know, it was denied in terms of for Najee Davenport's case had to do with dementia and the effects of, uh, you know, just the, the wear and tear, uh, the, the head injuries, the trauma that he endured over a lifetime of playing ball, and specifically as it related to the NFL, his time in the NFL, and how the, the effect it had on early onset dementia. Uh, but it ended up being denied by the NFL falling back on, yes, what is unambiguously um, a, you know, heart, a practice that harkens back to the eugenic type stuff. And, and, and it is quintessential eugenics. It's the idea that, that you're actually, you know, you're developing lower baseline standards. So one thing that the NFL does with the concussion protocol is you do what's called baseline testing. And you have like a, a, there's a baseline cognitive functioning level that then is measured, you know, against that if you have a head injury. Now, when you look back at like these concussion claims, it's like there's been a billion dollar settlement and there's a lot of litigation and uh, you know, hand wringing about how that money is going to be distributed. So, you have, of course, had the NFL spouting out stuff uh, in, the, in the piece, like, you know, um, saying stuff like, today our focus is on eliminating the use of race norms in the claims process and restor- uh, restoring claims where they uh, were applied, right? This process is being overseen by the court, and the results of the investigation will be released publicly once completed. Just acting as if, like, oh, you know, yeah, uh, this is like, we're, we're getting, we got rid of it now, so what, what, do you, what else do you expect? I mean, it's 2021, and they're acting like it's somehow, like, they're making a, a good move here by, you know, abandoning something that's just unambiguously racist. I mean, uh, you had this, you've already had 800 million paid out to over a thousand players that have been diagnosed with dementia, Alzheimer's and other brain related, you know, diseases. But the fact that Najee Davenport's claim being denied and him being kind of someone a lot of people know in NFL circles, um, that really brought this to the forefront of people's attention. And then now with the Washington Post story, coming out in the NFL statement on this and uh, the way in which, you know, they're just kind of acting as if like, Oh, we learned from it and we're just kind of, we're committed to eliminating this now. So I'm sorry. They said, quote unquote, I'm sorry for the pain this episode has caused black former players and their families. Ultimately this settlement only works if former players believe in it. And my goal is to regain their trust and ensure the NFL is fully held to account. Well, I mean, what does that mean now? I mean, you're basically saying now that we've been exposed and it's being talked about outside of the circles of just sports media and people are becoming aware on this, aware of this on a mass level that, oh, we're sorry, this is bad PR. But what do they really learn? I don't really think a whole lot. 
Yeah, and of course, I'm wondering, uh, you know, as much as they're committed to ending this practice and, uh, you know, they 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 want to do better going forward, is there going to be any retroactive uh, pay adjustment in the, uh, the the reduced settlements based on this racist practice to the players who receive those reduced settlements based on the racist practice? So, you know, this is just, I think, another one of those cases where uh, there's a lot of uh, politics and power uh, in sports where, you know, people at the top are making decisions that are, you know, really detrimental to uh, the players, the people who make the actual money, who are significantly mostly people of color. And I think, Nate, that is something that is true not just in the NFL, but we're seeing it again in other sports like tennis. Because I, I'm curious about your take on the situation with Naomi Osaka. Now, I, I did not know that the press conferences, the the media interviews that the tennis players at the French Open uh, have to do are actually required. They have to do them. And Naomi Osaka got into a lot of hot water because she opted out of doing them. She didn't do them. So, I mean, what is going on with this case and what does her treatment mean in this context of, you know, people at the top of these NFL or or sports franchises making decisions that end up harming the players who make them the money, who are, you know, mostly black and brown folks. Yeah. So, I mean, I always go back to Marshawn Lynch and I've, I've went to the famous press conferences. There were some of the best ever, right? I'm only here. So I don't get fined. It's Super Bowl 48 in New Jersey where between the Seahawks and, uh, and Broncos. And that was because he had been burned by dealing with, with mainstream media and sports media type reporters before Marshawn Lynch is one of the most charismatic, like dudes who's got like, you know, a lot of, he's a, he's a funny cat. He's hilarious actually. And he's uh, someone that's very out and open with who he is. And, uh, but he's just genuine, right? When you think Marshawn Lynch, you think being you were being real as it gets. And uh, but the reality is he, that had been taken advantage of that trust, and he had been basically portrayed as kind of like you know in a way that was meant to suggest his intelligence was uh, not what we what it actually is. And you know, one of our co-hosts, our Justin Williams with Redspin Sports, had worked at Amazon before doing like commercials actually, and uh, he uh, he had worked with Marshawn a number of times, and he knows personally. I mean, Marshawn Lynch is as sharp as it gets, and to get to the, the so his issue with that is in the NFL and tennis and all major sports. Uh, like Naomi Osaka is now in the news with this with the French Open, is that there is a requirement to talk to the media. Um, it's uh, is rooted in the, the logic that the reason sports are popular is the fact that fans uh, pay a lot of money to watch them, to pay a lot of money in cable subscriptions. You know, so uh, there's a lot of advertising dollars out there that people got, you know, grab on social media and, and other kind of platforms now too. It's all based on eyeballs and interests. And to keep that, the logic is you need to keep your athletes like speaking to the media. But this runs into a huge contradiction when in the case of Naomi Osaka, she's citing mental health. And there's all this talk you hear the NFL and, you know, and, 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 and tennis and all major sports leagues really talking about the need to like destigmatize mental health and like the destigmatize conversations about it and normalize like discussions about it. But here you have an example of Naomi Osaka talking very clearly about the reasons she's not talking to the media in a press conference like format, the depression issues she's dealt with. And yet the response is still like, well, they, she had already been fined when she said that. And of course, like you know, the the tennis, the, the Grand Slam tournaments, which are the French Open, Wimbledon, U.S. Open, and Australian Open, says like on behalf of the Grand Slams, we wish to offer Naomi Osaka our support and assistance in any way possible as she takes time away from the court. Mental health is a very challenging issue, which deserves our utmost attention. But what they won't say is that they're going to you know give a waiver that they're going to like let her play without this like you know mandate because then that challenges the the overall. Um, logic of it and it, it could be challenged by other players that say why did she get a break from it and i'm getting fined for it then so they're not going to like make a break uh give her a break and it brings up the issue of why who has control over athletes labor like who are they laboring for and for whose benefit and uh and and, is, and the issue of mental health and like how i think mental health is being tokenized in a big way by professional sports leagues uh, and it's just it's it's astounding really the, the level to which it's being done because uh, you watch 
the, the, the propaganda basically coming out of all these leagues, you would think that they're sitting there on the forefront of uh, being social justice warriors on this issue. But when confronted with a real life example, in the case of Naomi Osaka, you know, we can't budge because precedent and all that other kind of stuff. So yeah, lots of contradictions. And, uh, and it, I think it really lays bare um, how superficial so much of this discourse is about caring so much about mental health on behalf of these leagues. It's just PR. Yeah, I agree. I think it is a kind of a tokenizing of a very uh, serious issue. And to me, it's all about um, them establishing a narrative. I mean, even as someone that doesn't follow sports closely, I do note that when athletes aren't always so enthusiastic about, um, you know, uh, uh, talking to the media after, you know, just playing at an elite level and giving so much of their uh, physical, mental, emotional faculties to a thing. I mean, it seems to me that they're punished and, you know, uh, being tarred with having a bad attitude and and things like this. And, you know, speaking of uh, shaping a narrative, uh, Nate, I know that soon it's being reported that uh, Coach K, Mike Krzyzewski, I never know if I'm saying his name correctly, uh, but, you know, obviously longtime a uh, decorated Duke uh, uh, basketball coach is uh, retiring soon. And and so it, this is being sort of, you know, lauded for his, you know, a career and all of that. But but it seems as though there's another story sort of lurking there about some of maybe the less uh, glamorous aspects of uh, Coach K here. Right. So I mean, he's being like, you know, paraded around in the media now and presented like the greatest coach of all time. I mean, if you want to just talk on the court, I mean, John Wooden has like, what, 10 national championships to his five, but that's not really the issue. I mean, the issue is like how he's presented as this paragon of virtue um, as like the symbol of like, I think really the personification of like American exceptionalism in sport and the way in which like he's held up as an example of like the system being ultimately good. He's a tough leader. He demands a lot, but he's someone who's always talking about growing the, you know, uh, the whole, the whole individual, helping develop the whole individual, um, helping care. He cares so much about his players. Uh, he's so much about like the you know values and principles and, and, uh, and all these things that are like the, the bootstrapping type mentality. And coach K is sort of like a, a cultural touchstone for the ruling class and like the projection of like, you know, American sport, American culture at its best. When the reality is this is a guy who's graded student reporters, like all the way back in like 1990 and just last year um, for asking reasonable questions um, is extraordinarily power hungry. I mean, the guy is like retired, retiring now uh, to take a huge swan song of a season and have everybody pat him on the back for an entire year now. So it's going to just continue to go on now. Um, and if it wasn't about him and it's all about the players, uh, there, there's a lot more people to kind of show that with their actions. But I think that just the whole, not to mention his support for like right wing politicians, his whole life, uh, is, uh, the way in which this guy has, uh, has been held up, I think is, is really an attempt, uh, now with corporate media doing it to such an extent these last few days to, make it feel like we need something to celebrate that he is something that's like objectively good that transcends partisan divides. And the reality is this guy has always been kind of two faced. There's a soft spoken academic sounding professorial sounding coach K uh, we hear and how he projects himself in the media most of the time. And then there's the guy who <laughs> berates people, talks down to people um, is, is very much domineering with others. And, uh, you know, and, and supports like an American exceptionalist politics that uh, is very damaging to oppressed people all around the world. Not to mention, you go back to Michigan, the Fab Five, the way Duke basketball has been held up as kind of a, you know, seen a lot of times as like a, you know, a symbol of like sort of middle American values and really in stark contrast to like the urban, you know, uh, sort of like culture of like the, the Michigan basketball into the Fab Five or UNLV with the, you know, their, their teams that were considered like a renegade program. And, um, I think that uh, Coach K is really a symbol of an America that, like, you know, a lot of uh, the liberals, too, um, are trying to hold on to um, and are trying to, you know, preserve. And, and, and it's a false America. It's America that hasn't really existed. It's like the 1950s type, like uh, the way that's talked about and romanticized. I feel like Coach K is like kind of in a similar vein. Um, he's a symbol of, of a world and, a, and a, of a social order they're trying to maintain. Um, and it's one that's being chipped away at and for good reason, because of uh, it's all its systemic issues and the violence that the system inflicts on the world and the racism here at home. And 
how all those things are connected. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to be shedding tears for Coach K put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that. Well, we thank you so much, Nate, as always, for joining us today. We're going to leave it there and move to a break here on By Any Means Necessary on Radio Sputnik in Washington, D.C. But we will be back, so please stay with us. By Any Means Necessary. 